Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Chris Chinock uh, from Insight Media, and I am your host and organizer for today's webinar, uh, which is sponsored by the Looking Glass Factory. Uh, the topic for today is the mobile opportunity for light field and holographic displays. So we have uh, two great speakers today, uh, Anton, uh, Anton Yakubenko, who's the VP product of 3D Capture at Occipital, and Sean Frain, who's the CEO and co-founder of Looking Glass Factory. Uh, the agenda for today, uh, we'll have some presentations first by Anton, uh, uh, then Sean will give uh, some pre uh, a brief presentation as well. Uh, I've prepared some questions that I'll be asking both of these gentlemen uh, for a little bit. Uh, and then we'll also um, uh, entertain some audience questions. So please use the questions tab uh, that's on your control panel for the webinar. And we've also got two audience polls, which we'll throw in uh, toward the end of the webinar. Uh, it is scheduled to last uh, about an hour, but if we have some good discussion going on, uh, we'll probably continue a little bit past the hour. Of course, you're welcome to stay as long as you like. Um, in the registration process, uh, I asked you all to tell me kind of where you sat in this light field uh, and holographic ecosystem. And there were, I think this was 11 or 12 uh, options here. And you can see uh, we've got a pretty broad range of folks representing uh, all, all parts of the ecosystem here. Uh, and this is a, actually a very good um, indicator of the, of the broad interest of this topic. Um, displays, of course, is very interesting. Uh, but it, look at enthusiasts. These are folks who just have interest in what's possible, I think, in light field and holographic displays and capture and, and transmission. So I will stop with uh, my, my introductions here. Uh, I'm going to now switch over to Anton's presentation. And Anton, I will uh, turn the microphone over to you, but I will drive the slides for you. Cool. Thank you, Chris, and uh, happy to participate in this webinar tomorrow. Uh, very excited about the new Looking Glass uh, product and uh, would focus uh, my presentation on what is Occipital, uh, what is Canvas, and basically how the democratization of 3D capture may impact this whole uh, 3D uh, industry, including uh, holographic uh, displays. So next slide, please. All right, so my name is Anton Yakubenko. I am VP product of 3D Capture at Occipital. I joined the company around uh, a year ago, uh, and, but before that, I've been working around 15 years in 3D Capture reality industry and also have a PhD in this uh, sphere. Next slide, please. So Occipital has been founded uh, shortly after the first iPhone has been introduced. Uh, and uh, for the first uh, few years, it has been uh, focused uh, on basically giving the mobile devices the power of computer vision. Uh, some of you may remember some of earlier Occipital's apps, uh, such as the Red Laser, which was a backward scanning app, which has been acquired by eBay, uh, as well as 360 Panorama, at one point of time, the most popular app for creating uh, 360 uh, spheres. Next slide. Uh, but perhaps uh, Occipital most known for its structure sensor. Basically, in 2013, uh, we didn't want to wait uh, years until uh, depth cameras would be embedded into mobile devices, and we wanted to accelerate uh, uh, this uh, vision that everyone with a mobile device could capture the world in 3D around them. Uh, so we have uh, created uh, a successful Kickstarter uh, campaign uh, to launch uh, Structure Sensor, which is the first uh, mobile sensor, uh, mobile 3D sensor. Basically, it's a, a proprietary uh, a device which you can attach to an uh, iPad or then like iPhone, uh, as well as use with other like uh, platforms, and it allows you to capture depth. And then we provided an SDK for tracking and mapping. And uh, we saw people using it for a variety of purposes, starting from object scanning uh, to room uh, uh, scanning to navigation of robots uh, 
to measurements uh, and so on. Next slide, please. And we were particularly excited about capturing spaces in 3D, uh, in particular for home improvement purposes. That's why in 2016, we launched Canvas, which is our app for capturing spaces in 3D for home improvement professionals and turning these uh, 3D scans uh, into professional grade editable uh, CAD models. Uh, over the years, uh, thousands of uh, professionals have adopted this app uh, because it saved them a ton of time on measurements and uh, manual uh, drafting. And basically now Canvas is our like uh, flagship uh, product. Next slide, please. Uh, so for years, Canvas uh, was uh, used uh, exclusively with uh, our own structured uh, sensor. But uh, this uh, uh, spring, uh, Apple has uh, come out with iPad with embedded LiDAR. And shortly after, we have uh, supported this new device uh, for Canvas as well. It's actually had like a dramatically positive uh, impact on our business. Uh, first of all, uh, we doubled the volume of scans. Uh, just in a few months since the production of uh, um, uh, support of uh, iPad with LiDAR. And this is because it has become far more accessible and easy to use. You don't need to buy like a special hardware. Uh, there is like no setup, no calibration. It's super easy to use. Just download the app and uh, start scanning. Uh, plus, uh, with LiDAR, we were able to make our algorithms more memory efficient. Uh, which allowed people to scan larger spaces like the whole house uh, all at once. So it was definitely a like a breakthrough uh, a moment uh, for us. Um, and before we go to the next slide, uh, basically in October, uh, Apple has uh, introduced um, uh, iPhone uh, with uh, LiDAR and uh, we were lucky to be uh, featured in their uh, keynote. And because it's such a, uh, I say, groundbreaking thing uh, for us and in general in our opinion for the whole like 3d reality capture industry i suggest us to spend uh, a minute and actually uh, watch uh, this uh, apple's keynote uh, uh, video of light introduction once again uh, chris could you please turn on the sound uh, for this video we've pushed the industry for deaf technology over the years and today we continue that innovation with a lidar scanner LiDAR stands for light detection and ranging, and it measures how long it takes light to reach an object and reflect back. We've adopted this technology for iPhone, and with the machine learning and depth frameworks of iOS 14, iPhone understands the world around you and builds a precise depth map of the scene. It enables object and room scanning, photo and video effects, and precise placement of AR objects. LiDAR makes iPhone 12 Pro a powerful device for delivering instant AR and unlocking endless opportunities in apps. Cool, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, so basically, uh, even before um, iPhone with LiDAR, we already had um, a version of our Canvas app to run on a regular smartphone, which uh, doesn't use uh, any depth camera, and we extract uh, depth just from like imagery. Uh, but LiDAR definitely gave us a boost uh, in terms of uh, accuracy, quality, and robustness uh, of scanning and the results uh, that we get. Uh, in the original canvas, um, since it was uh, made for professionals, it allowed more flexibility. So uh, a user could walk around the space uh, uh, to scan like each uh, detail in each area. With the iPhone version, we decided to go like a more uh, consumer oriented uh, route and uh, introduce a simpler UX. Basically, when you stand uh, on the same spot, uh, in the middle of the room and just like spin around uh, yourself. Uh, and that has uh, boosted uh, the number of downloads, users and scans uh, really dramatically. So basically, if you would see like the chart of a number of our live scans, it was going like up slowly and with the iPhone introduction, it was like that. Uh, so uh, this is definitely an extremely popular uh, device uh, and it opens up uh, a huge uh, new variety of applications. So if in the past uh, Canvas was 
mostly used and adopted by people in home improvement industry or adjustment like professional spaces with the introduction of the new iPhone, uh, we see a huge variety of use cases and basically a lot of 3D enthusiasts, uh, people who work in AR and uh, VR, people who want to uh, capture stuff around them to put it into Unity or Unreal or something like that. So we see uh, a huge number of uh, use cases which we didn't envision um, uh, when we were working on Canvas uh, in the past. Um, so let's move on. Uh, yeah, so in our opinion, the LiDAR in mobile devices uh, is really a game changer. So we anticipated this moment for actually for years, uh, since uh, approximately 2013, when Apple has acquired PrimeSense and everybody thought, at least uh, in, in our community, that okay, in a year or two, we'll have uh, depth sensing embedded into mobile devices. We needed to wait like for seven years, uh, but now it's here. and. Uh, since I've been working in this industry for quite some time, I can remember uh, the times, uh, you know, like a decade ago. Uh, that's why I'd like to describe uh, how impactful this, uh, uh, I say, this democratization of 3D capture is. So if you go back in time, uh, for you to capture something in 3D, whether it's on an object, a space, or a dynamic scene, uh, you were required to have some special uh, equipment which sometimes required some setup, so it was definitely not for the wide audience of uh, uh, consumers. Uh, if you wanted to get something uh, high quality, high accuracy, you needed to invest in extremely expensive equipment such as laser scanners, which were costing like a decade ago, uh, starting from $50,000, and now they still are expensive and start from around $15,000 uh, and still prohibitive for the mass market. Uh, if we talk about the photogrammetry solution, basically extracting uh, 3D data from regular images, uh, it was extremely time consuming, both on the capture side, when you need to capture dozens or thousands uh, or hundreds of images, as well as on the processing uh, side, which requires uh, hours of uh, processing. And finally, it was not like you really like user friendly uh, because uh, you didn't get like much of the real time feedback. You didn't see what you uh, get as you scan. It's more like capture and then separately uh, processing. So you really need to uh, nail down some tips and tricks uh, to be successful, or you may need to go back on site uh, to capture uh, data once again. Uh, let's switch to the next slide. Yeah, so if we speak about the LiDAR in iPhones and iPad, uh, to give you some like technical uh, data, the LiDAR sensor itself, it's pretty low resolution. It's only a little bit over 500 uh, 3D measurements uh, uh, per frame. So it's really rough. Uh, at the same time, uh, with the help of uh, uh, AI or machine uh, learning, uh, Apple uh, introduced a way uh, to create a much higher resolution depth map, which is a combination of uh, true depth uh, uh, data from LiDAR and some, I say, like uh, filling in the missing uh, pieces using AI uh, photogrammetry and uh, so on. So now you can, uh, starting from iOS 14, you can get a relatively high res uh, depth uh, map. It's still not, um, uh, I say, not good enough for uh, scanning some small uh, objects, but when we talk about uh, larger objects, when we talk about people and, and uh, spaces, uh, that's uh, already uh, good enough. And that basically means that uh, now uh, many people will have like a, a 3D scanner in their pocket. So that's the first true moment uh, when it's uh, really democratized a 3D capture. In the past, uh, you may have uh, seen some other attempts, for example, Google Project Tango, which was like a specialized smartphone and a couple of uh, third party uh, manufacturers supporting it, but it didn't really take off. Maybe it was too early for its uh, time. But since Apple is often a trendsetter, uh, now we have uh, more beliefs uh, that uh, 3D capturing has finally become a commodity in a good sense. 
Uh, and even if not uh, all the uh, current and future devices would have a uh, depth camera embedded, uh, the ability to easily collect depth uh, data is extremely helpful for machine learning uh, applications. It means that step by step, by collecting more data and by training more machine learning algorithms, uh, we'll be able to extract better and better depth from uh, regular cameras or from a combination of a couple of cameras which more phones uh, have at the moment. So if we look uh, deep into the future, uh, you can't be sure that um, like each phone would have like an active depth sensor, but you will be you can probably be confident that the combination of um, uh, the like AI algorithms and some data acquired by depth sensors could allow uh, almost any device uh, to extract uh, depths from the regular images and video. Next slide. And this, yeah, Chris, next slide, please. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and this uh, leads us uh, to um, more opportunities, uh, including uh, using uh, the capture 3D data in holographic uh, uh, displays. And Looking Glass is definitely one of the leaders in this space. Actually, Exhibitor and Looking Glass uh, have been knowing each other for some time and uh, this like uh, video is actually from CES 2019 so like approximately two years ago which shows a, uh, like some canvas a 3D scan and structure sensor inside uh, the looking glass uh, uh, display. Uh, next slide. Come yes, on. basically okay. Uh, step by step, um, the 3D scanning becomes like uh, far more uh, accessible. Uh, but uh, the important thing to understand uh, that it's just like a stepping stone uh, to many uh, um, applications, at least like business uh, applications. So, for example, if we talk about uh, home improvement, if you give a, a remodeler, an interior designer, an architect a 3D scan, they uh, often uh, don't know what to do with it. So they need uh, like one step uh, further. And how we see the future for uh, us at like Canvas and Occipital is uh, basically trying to get more data and uh, more knowledge from the uh, 3D scan. So we already uh, can create great 3D scans in a very efficient manner high quality, uh, high accuracy, uh, usually like plausible uh, looking in many cases. The next step is semantic understanding of the scene, like recognizing the types of the objects and segment the objects uh, out. We have some proprietary technologies for that, but their kit actually also provides more and more of this uh, just out of the box. The next step is uh, converting this knowledge uh, into more digestible forms, such as extracting walls, doors and windows. And finally, like the ultimate um, goal is to create what we call a semantic replica. Uh, basically, it's a semantic CAD model, uh, which uh, shows like a clean, uh, maybe simplified uh, um, uh, space, uh, and which is like editable, easier to me measure, plus it's more private. So you don't share, you know, uh, something that you didn't want to share with the uh, home improvement professional. You just share the data that uh, they need. So in our opinion, that's uh, uh, the future, that uh, more and more people will be able to create uh, um, 3D captures of everything around them. And then like a step um, uh, two on top of it is turning this uh, data uh, in something uh, more like digestible, like a semantic replica, if we talk about spaces. So, so that's all on my side. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Anton. Nice, nice clapping, Sean. <laughs> okay, I'm going to hand it back over to Sean. Great. Um, thank you, Anton, uh, for being a part of this and for the long relationship with. Uh, Occipital. I actually I walked over um, to uh, let me just see here. Yeah, I, I this is I was one of the first backers uh, of Structure Sensor way back in the day, and I think our our team bought a, a few of these as well. Um, so long had a lot of um, excitement um, personally and in the Looking Glass team around what you all have been doing on the capture 
or input side is how we think about it. And um, uh, when you all came out with Canvas, I immediately down uh, for the iPhone 12 Pro, um, immediately downloaded it and was truly blown away. So I would say anyone who hasn't tried this, um, we haven't talked about this ahead of time. Anyone who hasn't tried this, you really have to download it because there is some amazing um, stuff that's going on behind the scenes there that makes for remarkable stands with this new class of phones powered by um, LiDAR sensors on the back of them. Um, so I'm gonna share a little bit about um, a new product that uh, some of y'all who are on this webinar um, know about the Looking Glass Portrait, which launched about a week ago. Um, then I'm gonna get into a little bit about how the technology works, and then um, specifically how it's related to uh, this revolution really in three-dimensional mobile capture that will then feed into this parallel revolution in my view and in our team's view for holographic light field output devices like the Looking Glass Portrait. So let me um, uh, start with a quick video. This will give a two minute or so introduction of our newest product, the Looking Glass uh, Portrait. Uh, so um, that's an introduction to the first personal holographic display looking last portrait. And I'm going to explain a little bit about um, what we hope this can do. Uh, again, on this um, kind of uh, dual track of the revolution in media that we see happening, uh, both with regards to capture devices on the mobile side and what Occipital is working on, and then on the output side of holographic light field displays. Um, so I have a quick slide deck here. Um, Chris mentioned this, but I should um, say again that um, I'm, uh, uh, my name's Sean Frain and uh, I'm co-founder and CEO of this company called Looking Glass Factory. We're based in Brooklyn, New York, home of the hologram. And um, I'm actually chatting with you from Hong Kong where we have a subsidiary where about a third of our team um, is, where we do a lot of the hardware development. And um, we make the whole widget of this new um, device that you just saw, um, the class of which 
a lot of folks have different names for um, spatial display, um, autostereoscopic, so and so, light field display. Um, but what most folks would recognize, I think, in the general population, although not necessarily on this call, as a holographic display. Um, folks can check out our 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 website, look.glass, for more of the information um, on this specific product. And that's not the main point of um, this webinar. But I did want to mention that um, we think that people and characters represented holographically uh, is a critical step towards holographic displays being something that everybody in the world has. And Looking Glass Portrait is hopefully going to be a key contributor towards unlocking that future. Um, part of why that is all culminating um, at this exact moment in time is because the phones in a lot of folks' pockets uh, have these three-dimensional capture capabilities, some of which Anton was mentioning. Uh, Looking Glass Portrait can run completely standalone or in desktop mode, and we think that's important for folks to have a persistent piece of the holographic future representing someone or something that they care about on their desk um, all the time. Uh, and it's very different from our previous generation of technology that Anton was showing in some of his slides from um, a couple years ago. Uh, in this system, the holograms actually extend beyond the physical bounds of the device itself. Um, just very briefly on how the technology works, uh, we, we made up this word, super stereoscopic, but I think it uh, explains how the technology um, works in a single word. And that's that um, by analogy, the screen that you all are looking at me at right now presents a single view. Um, and the pixels from that screen shine with two properties of just intensity and color. And that's why I'm not as real to you through this screen as I would be if I was sitting right across the desk from you. Um, AR and VR headsets primarily represent two views of a three-dimensional scene that changes as the user moves around in some cases. Um, to, but that's for a single user. Um, to allow multiple folks to be able to see and interact with three-dimensional content um, in a display like Looking Glass Portrait, we have to produce dozens of views. In the case of this new version of the technology, we pre present between 45 to 100 perspectives of a three-dimensional scene, either captured from the real world or captured from a synthetic environment, like something that you might build in an engine, a game engine like Unity or Unreal or what have you. Um, and we just push those, we sort of project out those different views into, free, into, into the world, and they um, sort of wash over people's eyes that are gathered around the display. Um, so it is very much like sitting around something in the real world because we're representing um, objects and things and people just as they're represented in the real world. Um, by pushing out many dozens of perspectives, we add a third property to this display. And we control that and update it 60 times a second so that it's updatable. And that third property is directionality. So as opposed to the screens that are on the phones in your pocket right now or what you're, look, what you're watching me on, um, on your laptop screen or what have you. Um, looking glass shines with millions of points of light that have the properties of intensity, color, and directionality. And that um, unlocks this true dimensionality um, for this new type of interface. Um, and I mentioned as well, uh, the looking glass portrait is the first system that um, actually uh, allows the holographic content to extend beyond the physical bounds of the device, whereas our first generation system kind of captured those within a volume. Um, so uh, the main topic today, um, and something that's much bigger than us, but that we are definitely leaning into, is the fact that every portrait photo that's taken with most of the newer iPhones, um, you know, seven, eight, uh, 10, 11, 12, um, and so on, and a lot of Android phones as well. Um, every time you take a portrait photo, you know, the photos that kind of had the blurred out background behind the subject, behind that JPEG or their different file formats, but behind that image, there's a hidden file, and that's a depth map. And we can actually extract and use that depth map in our software stack to generate those many different dozens of perspectives 
to create a holographic photograph from a regular, what you would presume to be a two-dimensional photograph um, taken with a whole variety, millions of phones that are in people's pockets right now. Many of you uh, probably have um, one of these phones. Um, and it's just getting better. So when the, um, this is actually a little Lego clock on my bookshelf, um, and I just snapped a quick photo the day that our team got um, a version of the iPhone 12 Pro. And the quality of the depth map, combination of LiDAR and also some machine learning stuff going on in there, um, is just unbelievable uh, from a single point of view. And so then you can generate extremely high quality for single point of view capture um, uh, holographic photographs from it, as you can see on the right there. Um, there's something else coming too. And I'm not gonna dwell on this because the exciting thing is what a lot of folks can do with a single shot, a single snap um, of the phones that they have in their pocket and making holographic photographs from that. But um, there's a future as well where um, we go beyond even depth capture and do full light field capture and display. So that's a fancy um, nerdy way of saying capturing a bunch of different images from a, from a scene, real or imagined, and then having those different perspectives show and present out and project out from something like the looking glass portrait. Um, and the powerful idea here, which I think is going to be explored very heavily in the coming year, as folks start to get holographic displays um, by the many, many thousands on their desk, is that, um, well, you see here in this little ad that we made on the left, a hologram is just a movie displayed in space and time. Um, if you take a panning, 4K shot taken with a phone, so these were actually taken with a phone, um, then you can actually extract out those different perspectives and resurrect all the different directionality of light that made, in this case, me and that magnifying glass and my glasses real. So everything that exists in the real world is reproducible. And this is something folks have chased for many, 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 I'm very excited, many, many hundreds of years um you know going back from you know leonardo da vinci saying that you know the goal of the artist is to represent the three-dimensional world on the two-dimensional plane and to figure out how to do that perfectly um all the way up to you know one of the lumiere brothers who the brothers that created cinema was obsessed with three-dimensional representation of the real world and did a focus focus pull with a big old camera um, and actually made volumetric captures before he and his brother created cinema um, uh, all the way up till now, where we can actually achieve perfect representation and reproduction of people and places and what have you. So there's a lot that's coming um, that folks can start experimenting with right now. Everything I'm showing you is uh, possible to do with, with zero programming. Anyone who's an enthusiast can do all of this stuff, um, including video. So this is a depth camera, Zor Connect, but we've done a lot of video capture experiments with the structure sensor. We actually made an app for this back in the day. Um, and I have a bunch of home movies, uh, which I'm gonna try to convert into looking glass, uh, uh, to get running in the looking glass portrait. Um, but recording video messages, holographic video messages, and sending those to someone isn't something five or 10 years away. It's something that is literally two to three months away from thousands of people being able to do um, with this new class of both capture technologies like the depth camera that you see there, which is the Azure Connect depth camera, um, and uh, these new class of um, output devices like looking glass portrait. Um, this is about mobile. So I'd be remiss not to share that you can capture those minority report style um, holographic movies, you know, like where Tom Cruise was looking at his son projected out from the wall. Um, holographically, you can do that with uh, phones, um, some of the newer phones like the 10, 11, and 12 with third-party apps like Record 3D, um, which is made by a fantastic developer um, that we know, and um, that works in Looking Glass Portrait. So now you can display all of that, um, all of those holographic home videos that you might capture holographically. Um, you might see a theme here <laughs> that uh, capture and display are marching forward um, sort of hip to hip. Uh, we're releasing a new class of software to make this easy for folks to do without any programming. Um, but 
for folks who do want to build additional applications um, using Unity and Unreal and what have you, uh, of course, we have very well-supported plugins for folks who want to dig in deeper. Um, we even have stuff that gives folks even lower levels of ads access, and all that can be found on our website um, and our Kickstarter page where we're live now with this new product. Um, I mentioned that this system has two modes of desktop and standalone, um, and we're going to see this more and more uh, moving forward into the future where um, there'll be, and this happened with VR as well, where there's kind of a, a tethered mode, but then there's a standalone mode. So more and more folks can get exposed to and run the technology without um, needing to pull the resources from their main computer that they're using. And um, this new class of holographic light field displays has that capability. Um, we've been doing a lot of experiments with uh, what is possible um, with capture uh, uh, empowered by what our friends at Occipla have been making. So this is uh, seen using Canvas um, and uh, captured with iPhone 12 Pro, pulled in very easily just uh, mo a little bit before um, this presentation a few days ago, this was pulled in and we were amazed at how realistic this now miniature bedroom looked in um, the Looking Glass portrait. Uh, our friends um, in Japan um, at Steampunk Digital, they shared some incredible artifact scans, again, taken with um, occipital structure sensor. Well, not again. In this case, taken with occipital structure sensor. Um, and it, you know, um, kind of feels like the real artifact there. Um, shrunk down a little bit, but the real artifact sitting on your desk represented by light instead of by atoms. Um, you know, Anton mentioned a really realistic capture of people that folks um, can now uh, do. Um, here's an example from um, a company called It Sees 3D that um, really leaned in hard to using a uh, structure sensor. Um, and I've used this app to scan dozens, maybe hundreds of people. Um, and it's fantastic and all that stuff can be outputted through holographic light field display as you see here. Um, and then uh, in closing, um, something a little more personal, I guess. Um, uh, as I was, and I, I'm sharing this just because I posted a, a, a blog post about it, uh, uh, few hours ago um, for Kickstarter backers. Um, I, as I was looking for things to pull into Looking Glass Portrait that um, were interesting that had been scanned with structure sensor, um, I found this scan sitting on my computer of my brother Ryan's um, bear from when he was a kid. And my brother Ryan passed away a couple years ago from pancreatic cancer. So it really is something that can act like a very real uh, memory machine. Um, and I was a little bit surprised that I had this file and um, very excited that I was able to load it into uh, Looking Glass Portrait. Um, uh, so I'm excited to take some questions from everyone. Um, that's what we got. And of course, folks can check out what we're doing at look.glass slash portrait. That'll take you right to our pre-order campaign, or you can uh, dig in a little more on our website at look.glass. Great, that was awesome, Sean, thank you. <laughs> Well, we've got a, a lot of questions, and there's a lot of questions in the in the queue as well. So why don't we just uh, dig in here real quick? Um, so I think the, the first thing I would like to know is um, let's talk about the workflow. Uh, Anton, you've got a, an iPhone uh, 12 camera. You do a room scan. To tell us all the steps you and Sean to get that scan um, right onto the Looking Glass display. What do you have to do? What are the file formats? What are, Come in the steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So basically, if you have either iPhone 12 uh, Pro or Pro Max with LiDAR, or if you have iPad Pro with LiDAR, you just download uh, a Canvas app. Uh, we have a little bit different apps for uh, iPad and iPhone, though in a few months, it will be just like a unified app. Uh, but you don't need to do anything else rather than download an app. Then you do the scan, it's super simple. Uh, in iPad case, you just walk around the space and capture everything around you. In iPhone case, you stand in the middle of the room and spin around yourself to capture uh, everything. And uh, then you get like a 3D scan. Again, there are like some differences between iPad and iPhone uh, capture. On iPad, we only show you the um, uh, like uh, 
uh, non-textured uh, shaded mesh on device and you need to send it to the cloud for processing because the scans might be much larger when you capture like larger spaces uh, with iPhone we do the processing right on the device uh, and then you can uh, basically we generate an OBJ file uh, which has like native integration with looking glass display and you have a couple of options how you can actually uh, get it on iPhone you can just like connect it to your PC or Mac and just grab it from the folder uh, file uh, with uh, uh, iPad. Uh, in addition to this option, uh, you have like a share button so you can like send this OBJ file to your email or airdrop it to your computer. So in, in short, just uh, have an, a light enabled device, download Canvas app, do the scan. It takes less than a minute per room and grab the OBJ file. You don't need to do anything else as far as I'm aware of. And, and, and tell us what exactly is in, in the OBJ file. What is what exactly is the data? Yes. So basically, OBJ file is a standard and pretty simple file format, uh, which basically in our case uh, represents uh, the geometry. It's a number of like polygons, a number of triangles. So we basically know the uh, 3D coordinates of each vertex and how the uh, vertices connect to each other in like in polygons or uh, triangles and that represents the geometry in addition to this there is like texture is basically a single or multiple uh, image files uh, which are mapped uh, onto this geometry so we know that uh, the color of this like point in space is that uh, from uh, this uh, texture atlases so like in short it's like geometry represented as like polygons and uh, textures and the, and the iphone can do that that mesh generation and, and photogrammetry internally uh yeah so basically actually the new mobile devices become extremely uh i say high performance so if you compare the performance of the current like phone with for example the performance of macbook uh it's uh, it's pretty comparable uh now so it's amazing how much you can do on device and we were uh positively surprised that when we originally developed for like server processing on mac machines and then we transferred this on iphone we didn't see like any dramatical performance degradation sometimes which was surprising it was even faster because of like different you know gpu and machine learning uh, uh processes uh so yeah on iphone 12 pro or pro max you can do the scan of the room uh and it takes less than a minute uh, and then it's processed right on device and takes around half a minute uh, to get uh, the final scan okay okay so what happens with this OBJ file, Sean, when you when you get it? Well, so yeah, so if folks are doing um, full room scans or in the case of scanning people or objects that where you want to have um, the full um, the full capture, um, then you drop it into a 3D model importer and then that pulls it into which is software that we provide for free along with Looking Glass Portrait. And then all of the different perspectives, the many dozens of different views that are necessary for looking less portrait are under the hood um, generated every 60th of a second. So in the case of a 3D model in desktop mode, you can move it around, rotate it, or you can record the object or room or environment rotating around and have that run completely standalone because of this new standalone mode in the looking glass portrait system. And then there, there are a couple other um, related um, but different um, sort of file formats, if you will, that can drive into uh, this um, new output device of um, this holographic light field display. One of them I was, I was talking about of these depth photos or these portrait mode photos that are taken with phones. And in that case, you basically have a regular image. There's no special export format or anything like that hidden behind. This is I, I, remarkable that this is the case, but in fact, hidden behind um, most portrait mode photos, there is at least a depth map. In some cases, there's a bunch of other stuff, like where someone's eyes are, where their mouth is, yada, yada, yada. But at least there, there's a depth map. Um, and that's what's used to blur out the background and what have you. And, and by depth map, I showed some of that in the presentation, but it's just sort of a grayscale image, um, stuff that is closer um, to the camera is, you know, uh, a lighter color and stuff that's further away is darker. Um, and then we can use that to basically um, uh, extrapolate out a holographic light field or all those number of perspectives necessary. 
And then there's a, a, a third category um, of capture, which is that panning shot or light field capture. Um, and then that's uh, in nerd speak, it's sort of an image-based, um, direct image-based capture to direct image-based um, output. Um, meaning it's not converted to an intermediate format of a mesh. It's going directly from image in to image out. And there's some fidelity advantages that ha that can occur there, such as you can preserve refraction of light through uh, objects like magnifying glasses and, and things of that sort. Um, each of these is extremely powerful in its own way. So like an OBJ file is a super transportable format, meaning it can work in looking glass portrait, but it can also work on a mobile device. Um, that you can wiggle around, or it could work in a headset as well, um, whereas some of these others are more specific to uh, the um, uh, output device. So you, you alluded to this, uh, this application in your, in your talk and, and just now. Um, why can't you take a, um, an iPhone 12 to, to, to start? And uh, since your display wants 45 views, uh, let's do a, a slow pan uh, around a stationary object. Uh, capturing 45 views in a panorama. Isn't that, a, I mean, a, a very clean way to get those 45 images into your display? 100%. And so we, uh, the, the software that we're releasing um, called Hollow Play Studio actually supports that. Um, and uh, so it can either be a recorded video or a bunch of snapshots that are taken um, and either for turntables or straight um, shot. Um, yeah. And for, for, for people that can hold still, for five seconds or so for that camera to move or for objects um, that gives you uh, generally the most high fidelity um, output, but the least manipulable in other um, uh, in other sort of platforms. So that's specific to light field mm -hmm. display output. You can't really use that well um, on a headset um, that you can kind of use it in mobile. Uh, people have done that, but um, then um, but the advantage, of course, of um, taking a single shot is that you can capture kids, pets, um, things that are moving around and so on um, with uh, the power of the fact that these mobile devices can do portrait mode photos. Um, and then the power of the full on room scale LIDAR scanning that Occipital is doing is that you can get the whole the whole room and have it be or the or person or what have you and then have that you can rotate it around it's not just from a single perspective in the room it's um i mean it, you can manipulate it as if you had um you know uh if it is if you were kind of like a giant and you could look down and see the entire thing a joystick, a joystick kind of manipulation yeah yeah so in, in, in all these scans there's going to be uh, occlusions things that the sensor just doesn't see uh, so can you go back and do kind of secondary scans, Anton, to, to, to fill in those those occlusions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. So basically, uh, uh, we allow people, even in iPhone case, to move around uh, the space uh, to reduce the occlusion. So for example, if you're scanning like a table, you can uh, a little bit move right, move left, lean down uh, to have less uh, holes. Uh, but anyway, even if you're like almost perfect uh, uh, scanning person, uh, still uh, some holes might be uh, present. That's why we have like a proprietary algorithm to fill this uh, missing uh, pieces in, uh, mainly just for visualization and like presentation uh, purposes. Uh, so for example, when you scan with iPhone, we generate uh, like a very special uh, view that uh, when you're viewing the space uh, from the uh, first point of view, like near this uh, the spot that you have originally captured the space from, uh, you actually don't see like any holes at all. It's like completely like, you know, watertight. Uh, mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's not like a flat 360 panorama. You can still see some parallax and you can still move around. And that especially feels way, uh, feels great either on a holographic display or on a smartphone when you can, you know, uh, use the gyroscope to see this like uh, uh, slight uh, movements. So we do fill in uh, the holes like automatically uh, for you, at least in uh, some cases, not for like all, but at least for some. But what I think is important that uh, 
sometimes it might be risky when we talk, uh, for example, not about visualization applications, but about, for example, measurements, because this like uh, filled in holes is like hallucinated geometry. We cannot be sure that it will be accurate. Uh, that's why uh, when uh, users want to measure stuff, we uh, specifically hide the areas which have not been scanned, so they can only measure from their like real uh, geometry, which we could trust. I see. So you've you've partly explained perhaps the uh, the value of Canvas uh, because that was kind of one of the questions I wanted to ask you. I mean, the, the, all these phones have, as you've already explained a lot of sophisticated software to, to create the OBJ file so or other formats. So tell us kind of the, the, the top level, what's the value proposition of taking, adding that layer of canvas on top of the, of the capture? Yeah, definitely. It's an amazing question. Uh, so basically, AirKit and AirCore definitely open, uh, like I say, uh, ability for many developers to start developing their own three applications. And now you can find, I believe, a dozen 3D scan applications on the App Store. But one should remember that AirKit and AirCore have been specifically built uh, to be a lightweight uh, platform for, first of all, augmented reality applications. And when we talk about a very specific application of scanning spaces, uh, one can do like even better job that AirKit and AirCore uh, does out of the box. So instead of using uh, those like technologies, we have our proprietary SLAM and 3D reconstruction technology. And uh, it means that we can create uh, more accurate, higher quality, more consistent scans. To give you an example, uh, AirKit and AirCore is basically a dormitory. So it uh, tells you where you are in comparison to your previous uh, position. But when you are wandering around the space, you accumulate drift, you accumulate inaccuracies. And their kit and their code doesn't close this loop uh, to make the skin like more consistent. Uh, we do. And we apply some like proprietary slam, loop closures, global optimization uh, to create a uh, better skin. So that's like the first difference. The second difference is that actually there's like a huge gap between a technology and the product. So uh, most of our customers uh, don't use scans per se, they actually use our scan to get service. So they do the scan, uh, but they cannot actually use a scan in SketchUp, for example. They cannot uh, do any edits from the scan. It's not as convenient uh, to do some complex measurements uh, out of the scan as it is from a CAD model. So we provide them uh, one button interface uh, to get a, a CAD model out of uh, the scan. So our main value proposition for business customers says that uh, it's the fastest way to digitize the space and get a CAD model uh, out of it. But under the hood, it comes uh, to like two main differentiators from the out of the box technology. It's uh, as a uh, purpose specific uh, technology for producing better scans of spaces. And uh, it's like a specific set of product features uh, for people who want uh, to get more than just scan, but who want to get a CAD model, who want to do like efficient measurements, who want to share this 3D model with others using our web viewer, because like Sketchfab is an amazing tool for sharing any kind of uh, 3D models. But when we talk about spaces, uh, like navigation could be uh, made more specific for spaces, measurement tools might be more specific for spaces and so on. Uh, so those are like our two main differentiators. Okay. And and the time of flight sensor adds more uh, accuracy than a structured than a structured life uh, sensor, I presume. So what in in terms of generating those measurements now in the CAD model, how how accurate are, are they compared compared to reality? Is it a few percent? Yeah. Great question. And basically, it's always has been asked by our customers. So on average. The measurements uh, and the accuracy of CAD models that we extract from scans, whether it's structure sensor or LiDAR, is around 98-99%. Uh, it means that if you have something that is, in reality, 100 inches long, uh, our uh, software can show that it's anywhere from 98 to 102 inches uh, long. Uh, that's usually enough uh, for, I say, uh, applications such as uh, uh, quoting, 
planning and uh, design. But of course, if you are planning, you know, to install a new window, you need like, you know, one sixteenth of an inch accuracy. And that's uh, unfortunately not yet something that we could deliver or like LiDAR sensor, structure sensor could deliver. In terms of LiDAR versus structure sensor, actually structure sensor can deliver um, better resolution uh and true better resolution because we do measure around uh, 300,000 points per frame versus lidar in reality measures only around 600 points so it's like two orders of magnitude uh high resolution and this and uh, this is uh, very important uh, when you talk about scanning some smaller objects if you want to capture uh you know higher uh, level of detail that's why right. the customers for example in medical space they still use structure sensor and will use it probably for a long time because it delivers much better like uh, level of detail. But when we talk about spaces, we actually care about like larger structural elements like walls, doors, windows, even baseboards, they're like visible enough in like LiDAR scans. Uh, uh, that's why for us capturing spaces, it's actually uh, comparable quality of scans when we talk about utility applications. But the experience with LiDAR is much easier. You just grab a device, download the app, and you're ready to go. Versus with structure sense, you need to order a special device, you need to set up and calibrate it. Uh, that's why we saw like a tremendous uptick in terms of adoption when we started to support the LiDAR devices. Gotcha. Uh, we're we're already at, at the top of the hour almost, so I'm going to turn to uh, uh, one of our polls here. Uh, so get the audience involved a little bit, and then I'll turn to some of the audience questions as well. Uh, so speaking of applications, let's uh, let's launch this uh, this poll here. So I hope this is now visible uh, to everyone on the webinar. Uh, uh, I'm not going to read it to you. I, I'll actually go. Let me. I'll take this moment to look through some of the uh, the questions that are coming in here. Uh, and I apologize. There's a lot of uh, a lot of questions here. Uh, Canvas can be used for uh, scanning outdoors. Um, uh, Anton, correct? Uh, it's a great question. With uh, structure sensor, no, because structure sensor is uh, based on like structured light. So we actually project infrared pa pattern and the bright sunlight interferes with this pattern. So we do not get uh, uh, depth. It's a little bit better with our most recent structure uh, uh, sensor Mark II, which has two cameras. So we can still extract some depth from uh, like natural uh, textures. But in general, uh, since the introduction of uh, LiDAR, we have slowly moved uh, uh, to supporting uh, LiDAR first and foremost for Canvas. That's why you cannot even buy structure sensor now for uh, Canvas purposes, because we have found that for scanning of spaces, LiDAR is a uh, better uh, option. Uh, in, if you use a LiDAR device, uh, you can scan uh, outside uh, in general, but uh, you need to keep in mind uh, two limitations. Uh, still, very bright sunlight may interfere with the uh, LiDAR uh, sensor, so you may get like worse or not like complete depth. And second one is range. The LiDAR range is around 15 feet or 5 meters. That's why you can easily scan the first story of the building. Uh, but uh, when it comes to like the second uh, story or up or the roof, uh, that becomes uh, challenging. So we do have customers who uh, scan uh, exterior uh, spaces and we can actually convert those to CAD as well, but it has not been like our uh, major use case. So it is possible, but there might be some limitations. Okay, thank you. Uh, so for Sean, um, do, you, do you see Portrait as a kind of a version 2.2, uh, 2.0 of your technology or is this just kind of a, an extension product? Uh, it's the it's a generation two product for sure. So um, uh, you know it's it's uh, the first system that folks can get for under a few hundred dollars. Um, that we think well, this is playing out to dramatically increase the number of folks that have holographic light field displays um, that they can use for you know uh, uh, applications that are um, easy to do 
um, all the way up to like taking a portrait photo and then getting a holographic photograph from that, all the way up to um, developing the most complex inter uh, integrations um, with 3D workflows that they might be interested in. So really spanning um, the gamut there. Um, it's, uh, I think folks who got the first generation looking glass will see some similarities. Um, the core underlying physical principles are mostly the same, um, but the number of improvements on the um, hardware and on the software stack are so substantial um, that uh, we think it's gonna open up a lot of possibilities. Okay. You've also talked about the, uh, the talking about the resolution of, of light field displays now in a, in a different kind of aspect ratio. I think you call the portrait a four by three by two. Can you explain that? Um, yeah, so actually it, sh it should be probably three by four by two with two being the, oh. um, the depth. Uh, um, but yeah, that's uh, approximate. Um, so um, approximate, and this is different um, for folks who have slightly different stereo perception, um, but the approximate amount of comfortable depth that folks can um, see and interact with um, in looking glass portrait is about um, that aspect ratio of four by um, or three by four by two. Um, and actually you can, I don't know, I've got one on my desk here. So like if you see the thickness of the system, it's actually hollow. Um, so the holographic information can extend in front of and behind the main optical focal plane of the device. Um, I'll just show you, just to show you something. This won't come through well on um, webcam, but this magnifying right. glass is actually out about to here in the device itself. Um, and so I had, it's, yeah. you know, kind of refocusing um, out in there uh, in space. And, and, um, and so that's what, that's what we mean by that. Yeah. Has the thickness of that, that optical layer shrunk from your other displays proportionally? Um, the thickness of the actual optical layer is um, very, very thin now. Um, there is a hollow structure um, as you saw uh, me show, um, where um, holographic content can kind of exist um, within, um, mm -hmm. but it's not contained to uh, a slab of, um, you know, uh, high index, high refractive index material anymore. Okay. Um, so this, it's very wow. light, um, you know, uh, sort of tablet weight, um, a little, um, you know, in that range. And, um, uh, it's a different, um, it's a very different experience to interact with the holographic content in looking glass portrait versus what folks might've found in the um, first generation system. The closest that we've gotten to this before was our super, um, premium large scale, um, 32 inch 8k looking glass, which we announced, um, uh, earlier this year, or maybe it was late last year. Um, and in that case, you could um, have the holographic information extend beyond the physical bounds of the device itself. Yeah. And now we've rolled a lot of those advances into and more um, into looking glass portrait um, at a very, very um, accessible price point for folks. Okay, let me, uh, uh, I don't know how to display the results of this poll, so I'll just try to read it to you. Um, it says, uh, 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 what was your real world applications for this? 49% said real world captured data is their uh, their first choice. 4% said conferencing. 19% said 3D modeling slash preview. And 19% said engine based applications. So real world data mm. capture is clearly uh, a lot of interest uh, to folks here. Um, so um, let me ask you uh, kind of the, the uh, maybe the next obvious question is uh, if one of the key applications, I think that this is going to be video conferencing potentially, right? Uh, and uh, an ideal simple setup might be something like, you know, a portrait display uh, with an iPhone 12 or a similar smartphone plunked on top of it. Uh, what do we need to do to get there to enable real time video conferencing? Yeah, um, it's a, a great question. Um, we, um, so folks can already do, uh, as I mentioned, um, recording of, uh, 
holographic video messages 10 or 15 seconds long and sending those to someone else that has a portrait a looking glass portrait and then running those um real real time communication is already being experimented with very heavily in our community um there's there's a uh, um a great developer um in uh japan that has posted he's one of the winners of a looking glass hackathon from a year ago um and uh, he's posted a number of experiments that he's done with iPhone 11 and 12 um, doing um, uh, real streams. And then we've seen other folks, um, I'm, I'm trying to think about, um, which I think I can say generally that there's already been demonstrations of um, uh, video conferencing with looking glass products, um, some of which are using mobile. So in the experimental realm, um, this is already feasible. When it makes the leap to product is really going to um, depend a little bit on um, uh, the community um, that is gathering around holographic light field display. Um, as more and more folks start to play around with the experiments that um, are already floating out there in the community, um, I think we're going to see next year a, I don't know when next year, but I think we'll see next year the first productized versions on top of Looking Glass Portrait that hope, like it would be great if someone else made these um, on top of our platform um, of uh, real world conferencing. Um, we don't have a particular, we don't have an announcement or anything related to that, but we have enough tools out there um, and we see enough action and of course, given the environment that we're all in right now, um, I think there's a very high probability that 2021 is the year that holographic communication becomes something that folks can get access to. It won't be perfect fidelity yet. It won't be light field communication. So it won't feel like you're sitting across from a person in perfect fidelity, but it's going to lay the groundwork for this entire revolution in um, how we connect with one another uh even if we're a world separated from one another so 2021 is the year yeah and just case, chris uh to keep in mind that many phones now have the true depth front camera which we use right. for this and like video to communication which could also provide uh, depth information uh which i believe could be one or other way uh supported in holographic uh displays by looking glass so it's more like a matter of i say building a product layer because the core technology is already here yeah yeah and, and i can see um mobile devices also becoming uh, very popular now and they probably already are uh in real estate for example in selling homes or commercial buildings and as anton you've talked about uh, in in design and remodeling applications in commercial uh building applications but also in, in museums that's been pointed out so Kind of what, what are both your feelings for um, these kind of quasi-consumer commercial applications for, for light field displays? Uh, I can go first. Uh, so basically, before joining Accipital, I was a CEO and co-founder of another company called GeoCV, which was basically actually hired uh, by Accipital. And we were focused on creating 3D virtual tools for real estate. Uh, I think that uh, definitely the new phones uh, make it more accessible uh, for real estate community at the same time from my experience uh, in real estate marketing the uh, expectation of the visual fidelity and quality is extremely high so basically something should look like like a professional photo to be adopted by the mid and high-end market where the most of the marketing budgets are uh, so I, I think that it's just like makes this technology more accessible, but uh, still uh, it will uh, will require something like you know 360 panoramas in addition to uh, a, a 3D scan just to provide a very high uh, uh, fidelity. Uh, at the same time, it could be adopted by you know um, uh, do-it-yourself agents who don't want to. Um, you know, invest in more hardware or hire a professional or invest more time scanning. So like uh, I can see this uh, uh, being improved, I say, uh, for this like low to mid market by do-it-yourself do agents. 
Um, definitely the home improvement is a huge segment and we have already seen a uh, great adoption for canvas, but with uh, more accessible devices, uh, we can see that it could, you know, uh, be an order of magnitude um, uh, better and faster uh, adoption. I'd say insurance, uh, at least for uh, real estate uh, insurance is another uh, great application uh, because uh, it allows you to document the space to extract measurements better than like photography plus you can now do it like remotely with more and more people having these devices on hand you don't need to send like an adjuster or a technician to do the capture people can provide this uh, uh, data uh, remotely and there are like a number of other like just maybe not uh, that huge applications, but uh, very peculiar ones. For example, location scouting, like people travel uh, now like less, uh, but at least in the past traveled all over the nation and sometimes all over the world uh, to find some particular scenes for like ads or movies and so on. So ability to document those could be also interesting. So I think that there is like a huge variety of things that uh, people can do and we're only scratching the surface with this like uh, I say uh, top of the mind business applications. Yeah. Sean, any, any comments on that? Um, also, yeah. My, quite the next my, poll too, by the way. Okay, cool. Yeah, my screen just disappeared. So, um, yeah. but I guess I, I guess y'all can hear me. Um, you know, we're, um, we're making an implied bet that one of the killer apps of the hologram is people and that's why we released this portrait oriented system um, and having folks being able to replay their memories and uh, both photographic and video um, edging towards the dream as well of holographic communication with each other um, you know all of those things are implied um, and in some cases explicit in what we're doing now with um, looking glass uh, portrait but um, we've seen a huge amount of interest in areas like what Anton is describing, where folks perhaps um, can't travel as much, where they want to present um, an expensive piece of real estate or what have you holographically. I think um, at least uh, my read on this, which is a little biased, but um, folks generally don't want to put on a headset to um, transport themselves to another place uh, to preview a home or what have you. And so the um, promise of holographic light field display is that you can have a showroom that someone maybe has in their own home. And, um, you know, it becomes kind of a, a light field display becomes like this magic mirror that you look through. But instead of the reflection of the room shining back into your eyes, you're seeing something that um, is either synthetic that has been scanned or is maybe on the other side of the world. Um, so all of this um, is going to happen. Um, as Anton mentioned, the demand for visual fidelity is huge in um, cases of home preview. And um, also the scale has to be quite large. So it'll be a while before everyone has these in their home, but that is going to happen. And folks can get a taste of um, not only people um, holographically represented, but also like we showed with the canvas scan in um, these new uh, desktop systems, um, you can get a sort of dollhouse view of scans of real places uh, represented holographically. Yeah. yeah, and maybe like I would personally uh, would be very excited somewhere down the road to use it for e-commerce basically when you're shopping right. uh, to see uh, the products that you're considering purchasing uh, more like true to scale and like from various points, more like lifelike, as well as when we're talking about uh, uh, humans or like people like to have your like mirror and see uh, how the new like outfit uh, would actually look on, on yourself. And that's more like uh, about not like the small looking glass display, but more like you know the full size, like huge size looking glass uh, uh, display. But if you look into the future, uh, that might be uh, another potential. Well, on that point, you know, um, there um, this hasn't been done with Amazon, for instance, yet. But um, on JD.com, which is kind of like a sort of Amazon in China, um, they um, there are light field scans of products that you can manipulate around on your mobile device, and those are transportable to something like um, 
looking glass portraits. So right now there um, is this bubbling up of super high fidelity capture of um, objects for sale um, that could be tied with an output device like um, a holographic light field display. So there's absolutely a future where um, many, many, many millions of folks um, have um, have holographic displays in their home that are showing a character that speaks with the voice of a voice AI like Alexa or um, Google Home or what have you, where you can preview products inside of it, where you can replay your holographic home movies and then also communicate with someone um, that uh, might not be there in the room with you. Yeah, and there already is a market for, for 3D scanned objects out there, a database of those kinds of things. So. This yeah. is just a natural extension becomes a more a, a light field database with more fidelity, I think is what you're saying. Yep. Okay. Uh, so the, the poll that I have up here says, uh, can you see yourself displaying mobile 3D capture volumes in a looking glass portrait? And the answers are 87% say yes, 13% say no. So that's good news for you, Sean. <laughs> well, thank you for both of us uh, and Anton, thank goodness. <laughs> Indeed, um, there's there's uh, there's many questions I'm not going to get to here clearly, um, but uh, there's a there's a few just asking some more basics about the specs of the looking glass portrait, uh, field of view, and and resolution. Uh, you want to answer a few of those questions? Yeah, sure. It's um, the largest field of view of uh, any system we put out there so far. So it's um, 57 or 58 um, uh, degrees field of view meaning that anyone within um, that wide viewing zone, um, you get um, your, you know, a wash with different stereoscopic 3D perspectives that change as you look around um, the system. And if, you know, your kid runs behind you, um, they can glance over your shoulder and see a different point of view in 3D yeah. of what's in that system. And that's very different than the approaches that um, other folks have taken where it's a single tracked person or what yeah. have you. Um, so in that sense, it sort of exists in the room um, as a normal object would exist in the room. Um, and um, uh, well, what, what were the other questions again? So, well, one thing you've also said that the number of views can vary between 45 oh, yeah. and 100. So I'm presuming 45 is for uh, straight video capture and, and 100 could be up from, uh, from a game engine or a CAD model, is that correct? Uh, it depends. Um, there's a, a computational cost to more perspectives, um, mm -hmm. but the advantage of pushing more perspectives out is you get smoother backgrounds. Um, there's some blending that happens um, and so on. So uh, the quality basically goes up, but it comes at a computational cost. Um, we The reason we're able to um, uh, sort of talk about this with this new product is because we've overhauled our software stack to allow for um, uh, very rapid real-time generation of a much larger number of perspectives simultaneously than we have before. Um, so it just, it depends a little on what folks will, um, are um, doing. A lot of what's shown in the video on our homepage um, are between 45 to 60 perspectives. But for some of the things where you have a really deep background, um, we pump that up to like 90 or 100 views, and that blends the background um, quite a bit uh, better. Okay, gotcha. And and you've also got a processor that's embedded in this for, uh, I mean, you've, you're, you've got a whole lot of technology in a $200 device here. How do you do that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is actually, it's pretty unbelievable. Um, it's a, believe it or not, it's a Raspberry Pi 4. Um, that's inside of all the looking glass portraits. And um, we've been trying to do this for years. And a few folks in our team, um, uh, Kyle and uh, Vince and Evan on our team, they were able to crack this problem of um, how to um, basically um, really customize the Raspberry Pi 4 so that it could output super high quality recorded holographic media, totally standalone at up to 60 frames a second. Um, and again, we had many false starts over the last couple of years to try to achieve this goal. Um, and this, we, we think that was an essential um, step to being able to unlock this, um, uh, this new product. Of course, if you have a mobile processor inside um, that's more expensive and what have you, you can do even more 
Um, and, uh, you know, there are folks who have already been posting experiments, uh, plugging in some phones directly over, um, you know, uh, USB-C cable and what have you for the phones that can output um, up to 4K, um, which not all can, but some can, um, and controlling their looking glasses, um, including the, the first generation looking glass um, with an enhanced processor. So, um, you know, it has a Raspberry Pi 4 inside, it's uh, it's it's definitely a minor miracle that that works for running holographic light field media, um, and it took a lot of tricks to be able to do that. Um, and it's just you know it's off to the races from here. Sky's the limit. Yeah. Um, there's also some questions about um, other smartphones here. Um, so uh, like Android phones, and I know Anton, you you focus more on the the iPhone ecosystem. But uh, Qualcomm has just announced this new uh, 888 mobile SoC processor, uh, which looks like it's going to have um, all of the same kind of capabilities that's in the iPhone 12 at this point. Um, I don't know, Shane, Sean, I don't think you've looked at it too much yet, but uh, it, would that be your expectation? Uh, yeah, I haven't looked at it too much. I mean, we know in the headset realm that folks are leveraging um, some of those advances, like the Nreal sort of mobile pack thing um that then goes into the headset um and so it's uh um we, we've already exceeded the baseline necessary for widespread self-contained holographic light field display it's now just a matter of cost exactly what um uh the displays are running um and productizing a number of these applications that are going to be opened up um, by this new system um and there's already you know, honestly, there's already a lot that can um, be done with the system out of the box without relying on um, the advances from uh, these new Snapdragon processors and what have you. But that means things will just get better um, very, very, very fast. Yeah. Chris, speaking about Android, uh, we are not supporting Android at the moment, but we will next year uh, for Canvas. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, our core, which is like a, a Google's technology similar to our kit from Apple, uh, has like a depth API, which provides uh, developers access to depth uh, uh, data from the camera feed. And uh, if the phone has a depth uh, camera, for example, some top end uh, Samsung phones have like embedded depth camera, you can get uh, like uh, better quality, better resolution. Uh, I'm not sure how comparable is it with like uh, LiDAR, but I think for uh, applications like, you know, casual scanning or maybe scanning of spaces, that should be enough. Uh, and similarly, Air 4 has an option to uh, generate a depth map from a regular camera feed. Of course, it's not like as robust. For example, it may have some issues with like a flat and textureless uh, areas, which is a uh, standard for like image-based approach. Uh, but nonetheless, if we talk about like at least uh, some spaces and like humans, uh, I think that it's uh, uh, at least good step in stone to start experimenting with um, this tech as well. So uh, Sean, your display is, is horizontal parallax only. Um, there's been certainly uh, other light field display developers that have both horizontal and vertical parallax. Um, what, uh, what do you see for the need for vertical parallax and the applications that are kind of near term or longer term? Yeah, I mean, um, there, uh, there's an existing supply chain of LCD and OLED modules um, that's hard to diverge from. Um, to get a system with built in full vertical and horizontal parallax, you need um, you know, you, you need the square of the number of pixels um, in order to drive through those um, uh, vertical views as well. This might be too esoteric for um, some uh, folks on the call, but um, our eyes are horizontal. Um, so we get a lot of value from like stereoscopically from just pump, pumping out horizontal views. Um, and generally we're not doing this with content constantly on um, a holographic display like the, the looking glass portrait. Um, that being said, a lot of folks who are in our community discord um, talking about um, the looking glass, they have discussed building in um, uh, sort of um, tracked vertical parallax so that the scene mm -hmm. changes, it's still stereoscopic, 
but connected to a phone or other webcam or what have you. Folks have posted in the sort of hologram hacker community um, have posted a number of experiments demonstrating this. And of course, we've done a bunch of this stuff in the background too. Um, so uh, basically, I, you know, I, there are some companies who have made the bet on full parallax systems. Um, huh. My view is that that is not recognizing the um, uh, where the trade-offs are um, and where the benefits are for such a huge additional amount of huge additional number of pixels that you need, which don't exist. And they're not going to exist for 20 years in the supply chain um, of LCD and OLED mo mo modules and a huge amount of additional computation. Um, so, uh, I mean, I think they're barking up the wrong tree, but um, we'll see how it plays out. Okay, thank you. Uh, turning to a few last questions here. Uh, uh, let's, we've got three minutes left for an hour and a half, so let's, let's call it at that point. Um, uh, let me just quickly try and scan some of these here. Uh, is there a limit to the possible size of, uh, I think this is referring to the, um, to the looking glass display, size of the display? Uh, no physical limit. So we've already um, uh, announced and we've shipped um, a bunch of these looking glass 8K units, which are 32 inches. So it really creates a sort of holographic window, um, if you will. Uh, so um, uh, that's the biggest that we've released um, publicly, but there's no, it's not like a, um, uh, there's other types of three-dimensional technology, three-dimensional display technologies like volumetric displays where you're actually scattering light off of physical medium. Um, a light field display like the Looking Glass Portrait isn't like that. So we're just shooting out rays of light and um, that is not uh, scale limited. Um, the only thing that's going to limit the scale is the availability of pixels to drive into it and where the viewers are. So today we could make um, a wall size uh, looking glass um, and it would just be a low resolution if folks get close um, because the highest resolution systems that are out there are 8K generally available um, for LCD and OLED modules. Um, I mean, of course, there's a lot of experimental stuff and what have you. And if you want to have a seamless, I'm talking about a seamless holographic light field display, um, yeah. then, um, you know, in some cases, the viewers may be uh, five or 10 meters away. And in that case, that's possible today. We've made a deliberate choice for the technology that we've rolled out so far to be something that we don't have to define the viewing distance. You can be close, you can be far, you know, uh, when you walk away from it, the looking glass um, holographic imagery fades into uh, two-dimensionality at the same moment that the world fades into two-dimensional um, two-dimensionality because of how far your eyes are away from whatever you're looking at. So, um, you know, these are all just, uh, they're, they're all just choices. Um, but the fundamental technology is very, very scalable. Okay. One very quick question. Um, there was a question here about accepting side by side. Basically, uh, can you accept stereoscopic uh, input and create the, the 45 views? Uh, great question. Um, and actually, uh, on Saturday with our friends at the New York Stereoscopic Association, um, they uh, were doing a, um, a talk with them. Me and um, Missy from the team um, are doing a talk where we talk about um, how side-by-side -side stereo and other types of formats that folks might be capturing um, can be pulled in very easily into um, this new system. Um, and then we also walk through some of, you know, the we'll walk through some of the more advanced techniques um, that folks might want to uh, play around with for light field capture, et cetera, et cetera. But the answer is um, yes, we're actually going to have direct side-by-side -side stereo photo support in Holoplay Studio, which is the software that runs into um, uh, the PC and Mac software that runs uh, uh, the Looking Glass Portrait for generating holographic media for it that can then run on its own standalone. Great. All right. We've talked enough. Let, we'll let the attendees go. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. I've learned quite a bit again, as usual. And I thank you, attendees. So uh, I bid you adieu.
Great. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Anton. Thank you. To the future.